Hello and welcome to TidyX episode 53. TidyX is a screencast where we go through and explain how our code works. My name is Ellis Hughes and you can find me on Twitter at Ellis underscore Hughes. Yeah, my name is Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick and you can find both of us on Twitter at, at tidy underscore explained or you can email us tidy.explained at gmail.com. You can comment on and subscribe on the YouTube link. Uh, or you can open up a uh, issue on the GitHub page. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is episode 53. This is now episode two in the series that we're working on. We're going to work through uh, MLB pitch classification data. Um, Patrick, do you want to talk a little bit about what we're going on today as I share the screen so you can see what's going on? Yeah. So last week, uh, we talked about accessing this data using the MLB game day package in R. And then we pulled that data in. We did a bit of exploratory data analysis and cleaning. And as part of our exploratory data analysis, we started with some hierarchical clustering of this pitch data to um, get our head around which pitches have the have similar pitch t um, pitch variables. So it, it, with the pitch FX data, it's like spin rates and speeds and things like that so, so much um, data <laughs> yeah tons of data so we're looking at which we looked at which variables had a similar clustering uh, were similarly clustered together based on those variables uh, today uh, as with the next few videos in this series we're going to extend this into some different classification models that you might look at and then uh, for the big crescendo at the end of this series, we're going to compare the models using uh, uh, various different um, metrics for uh, evaluating model fits and seeing which one we, we think might be the most useful. So uh, I think from last week, all we have to do is load yep. the data in with yep. the clean data. Yeah, right? uh, quickly wanted to give a shout out to MLB Game Day for uh, pulling in or giving us access to the data through an R package. Um, and then folks that have given resources about pitch FX that we could also reference. Yep. Um, so yeah, so we're going to quickly, not going to spend too much time on this since we did this last week. If you're really interested in having us explain how we did this, check out last week's video. There'll be a link in the comment or in the uh, description below, but we're going to quickly just set our base path here to uh, the current working directory, um, set our option chunks here so that it'll actually reference those load in some libraries that we're going to be using. Um, so this is slightly different from last week. So we've got Tidyverse and Plotly for uh, our data manipulation and visualization needs. Uh, we're at library class, um, which I believe is going to be helping us with KNN stuff. That'll give us a KNN uh, function. Uh, we also have to load caret package. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that'll be, you know, we'll just throw that in there. Yeah. Library caret. And then yep. finally, we have UMAP. So UMAP is a interesting way to um, visualize multidimensional data. Uh, and we will talk about that at the very end of this episode. So we're, uh, we don't do much plotting uh, today, but we're gonna set our theme to be theme light so that everything looks pretty and nice. We're gonna load in our data. We used MLB game day to pull in a bunch of data and we just saved it as RDS files. So we didn't have to do that live because it takes a roll long time do that. So we've got our training set and our test data set um, critically, or I guess not critically, but they're, they're separate. <laughs> they're, they're different. They're not reliant on one another. Um, and then we do some cleaning where we're going to remove some pitch types that are not very common and remove any pitch types that are missing um, and select in su or subset to a key set of fields that we think are critical to describing the actual pitches themselves that we're actually going to be using as variables going forward. Okay. <laughs> We've got through our EDA stuff. You now, you now are an expert and you now know the data that we have. Um, so now we're actually going to get into the modeling. And so the first type of model that we're going to look at as Patrick referenced is uh, the KNN or K nearest neighbors algorithm. Yeah, um, which I think we've talked about. Yes, we have. And we I just don't remember the don't, episode. Don't remember which episode it was, but yeah, but it was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll put a link in the in the description below. So you, if you want to learn more about KNN, um, it will actually go into a lot more detail about it in that episode, I believe. But what we do need to do is we so we've done our initial data cleaning and extraction, but when you're going to do a machine learning, uh, when you're going to do machine learning, not a machine learning. <laughs> 
<laughs> machine learning, um, you need to make sure to scale your variables that you're putting in there because otherwise there can be one value that can dominate the the rat like the rest of the model. And yeah. it just kind of determines like if it changes by a small amount, then it just totally throws everything off. And so what you want to do is you want to scale it. And so the scaling that we're going to use is kind of like a z-score z scaling uh, type method here. And so we're going to create a little function for us to facilitate that. And so we're going to call it scale by, which is function here. We're going to feed in a vector x um, and then a uh, value for mean and a value for standard deviation. And it's a pretty straightforward scaling. We're gonna take X, subtract mean, and then divide by standard deviation. So what this is gonna do is gonna center that, that uh, vector of uh, values on over zero, and then it's gonna divide by the standard deviation so that it you know scales everything down into a reasonable size. Um, so next what we're gonna need to do is when you're scaling your training and testing data set, you very critically need to scale it by the same amount Otherwise, they're going to be centered around different values, and that's, that's not what you want. you want. You want them to be comparable. And so we're going to need to come up with a set of uh, means and standard deviations for each of the column types that we're going to be scaling and give them a standard to be using. And you always want to do this on your training data set. You want to calculate everything you're going to be manipulating any of your data with based on your training set because you don't want any information from your test data set to make its way into your machine learning tr uh, training piece. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take train cleaned, which is that cleaned training data set that we have here. We're actually gonna remove pitch type in this case because we don't scale pitch type. It's also not numeric, so we can't really scale it. Um, and we're gonna do a simple apply over each of the columns and calculate uh, and ask to get a list back where we get the mean of that column and the standard deviation of that column. Mm -hmm. So we, we run that, and so we get this vector uh, scale values where it's a list of lists. So we've got, so for like VX0, the mean of VX0 in our training data set is 2.299, and the standard deviation is 5.74. Mm -hmm. So now what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna scale our data down to this, the, these values here. Patrick, do you want to take us through this piece here? Yep. So uh, the first thing that we're going to do, we're going to do this on the training and then on the testing data set. So the first thing that we'll do is just create a vector of the pitch types. This would be the ground truth uh, from, from our uh, data. So these are the actual classified pitch types, the known pitch types. Uh, and then we're going to use that function that Ellis just built in the creation of this train cleaned scaled uh, data frame. So first things first, we get the column names of trained clean and we remove pitch type. So again, pitch type, we don't need it. It's uh, for, for, for these purposes, we've saved it in its own vector up above and uh, it's not numeric, so we're not worried about it. Then we're gonna pipe in uh, another list apply and we're gonna use, we're gonna put in function column name. So basically it's going to feed each one of those column names in. And um, we're going to scale by using that scale by function. The, remember the, that function took three arguments. It took an X argument, which is going to be the column name. It took a mean argument, which is going to be the average from our, uh, of that column from our list that we've created, and it's going to take the standard deviation of that um, column from the list that we created in that scale values list. And once we do that, we have everything in a list, so we gotta get it back to a data frame. So we do the, the old do call there, and basically we're saying do call, hey, change this entire thing back into a data frame. And then we finally set the names of our new data frame to be the um, column names of train cleaned and again uh, we got to get rid of pitch type because all we want here is our features that are scaled and then we do we'll do the exact same thing so now you can see everything is um, basically zero a, a mean of zero with a standard deviation of one so the values uh, that are negative there are uh, below the average and the values that are positive are above the average 
so we do the exact same thing on the testing data. Um, the one thing I'll say is what we could have done is we could have started with the entire data set itself, scaled all the columns using a mutate across. Uh, so just writing a z-score function and scaling across and then broke them up into training and testing sets. The one thing I'll say about that is that that's not necessarily always a scalable approach if you're going to deal with new data. So for example, if we had data for the next season, we don't want to have to retrain the model again, right? We want the model built. So we would probably save the model and we would also save that scale values list that we have because that model was built using the knowledge of the mean and standard deviation of our variables from that data set. Unless we have reason to believe for whatever reason that there's some drift where over the years, the mean and standard deviation have changed at an amount that would maybe warrant us retraining the model. Um, unless that's happened, this, this would be the approach that we would take. So this is scalable. So if we were gonna write this out to like a user interface in Shiny, um, where the person is maybe putting in new data, um, we would want to always reference it back to those scaled values. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Cool. All right. So now we have our trained or our scaled training data set and our scaled or yeah, scaled test data set. Yeah. So now we're going to actually throw it in to the KNN function, which yep. is the KNN's neighbors algorithm or function that implements the algorithm. And so there's a couple arguments here. Um, Patrick, do you want to take us through those? Yep, super simple function uh, and arguments. So KNN, um, we're going to say the training set is called train cleaned scales. We'll say the testing set is called test clean scale. If you wanted to build this first on your train set to like work on it, you would just put the exact same thing in as the test set. So it would basically be testing the data on the data that you built the model on. Uh, but we're not going to do that here. Um, the CL is, is uh, just class. So what is the class? So in this case, it's that vector of train pitches. That's the ground truth class that we're um, estimating to. And then K is the number of neighbors that we want to use in order to create a decision about which pitch class we want to classify our data in based on the variables in train clean scale. And so K can be um, uh, any value um, if you set it too low, you run the risk of overfitting. If you set it really high, you run the risk of over smoothing. So we're going to talk, that'd be really high. So we're going to talk about, um, uh, we're going to talk about in a second, just a simple way of, of, uh, trying to identify an optimal K. But in this case, we set it to four, just based on the four hierarchical clusters that we found from last week. And then I like to set prob equals to true. You don't have to do this. If you set prob equals to false, which I believe is the default, um, all you'll get back is the majority vote class from the model. So the model is going to look at the uh, all the different pitch types and based on the variables, the features that we fed it, it's going to give a probability across those pitch types and it's going to take the, the, the highest right the, the highest probability and it's going to assign it that class um, so if you set that to false all you get are results i like to set it to true because i like to look at the um, different probabilities and it allows you to pre you know create distributions and things like that so, mm -hmm. so we're going to run this it runs pretty quick because it's only four uh, neighbors and you can see it's already done so we'll create a nice little data frame here of our predicted um, values from, from the fit and we'll create a data frame of our ground truth observed values. So remember the fit KNN took as the test set, the test clean data. So we want to use the test pitches here um, so that it's consistent. And then we create a nice little confusion matrix. So the diagonal are all of our hits, uh, no pun intended. So Ta -da. those are the, um, <laughs> but um, so those are the, all the times that the model got it right. So as you can see at the uh, bottom there highlighted slider, um, nearly 2000 times the model predicted it was a slider and it was in fact ground truth, a slider. And you could see on the off diagonal are all the times where uh, we got it wrong. So for example, KC knuckleball, you can see that the model seemed to have a problem with that 126 times. It said, hey, this is a curveball, 
um, yes yeah, uh, again we don't know how these labels are derived so it might be like a human who's watching these pitches which I maybe people who are really tuned in and watch a lot of pitches can I'm sure have a, a, a decent enough ability to do intuition to do this I, I think if I look at all these pitches I they'd probably look pretty similar to me <laughs> uh, but yeah so um, anyway that's that's a little bit of the confusion matrix and this is the overall uh, table so we can calculate with this by using the diagonal uh, the sum of the diagonal divided by all of the data we can calculate a classification accuracy and one minus that classification accuracy is our misclassification rate so how frequently we got it wrong and you'll see that the model's not great um, if you hit the you run that and then run this you can see that nearly 30 percent of the time we classified the wrong uh, pitch womp so womp. <laughs> womp womp that's the overall classification rate we can also do this within the pitch type so um, we can do this by taking that table that we just built turning it into a data frame and then grouping by the observed and then summarizing the classification rate every time the frequency so once we do that uh that group by and turn it into a table it's going to create so this uh, frequency let's show column. them what this looks like because yeah, there we go. Um, i don't think a lot of people tend to call data frame on the results of a table what it ends up doing is yeah. the the rows of your table that you see here are, are on the left hand side yeah observed here's the second column i mean you can all ever i mean if you've called a table you can call a table on like 30 different Yes. like row, it can get ridiculous. But basically what ends up giving you is what what is the unique collection of those variables and what is the frequency at the very end? Yeah. And so it's always gonna have, so you can have as many as you want here, but the last column's always gonna be freak, F-R-E-Q. Yep. And so we yep. can use that because we know that here we're only passing two predicted and observed observed is the correct ground truth so we can do a group by on that to see how often we misclassify using yep. our model yep 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 so there it is right there we're basically because we're doing group by we're grouping by the um the observed the actual ground truth pitch and we're saying anytime observed is equal to predicted those are the values we want to retain and we want to divide those because this is a um that freak observed equals equals predicted, it produces a Boolean. So it produces a true false. And R will treat those true falses as a, a, a vector of zeros and ones. So basically we want to take all of the ones, all of the times where that happened, all the trues and divide them by the sum of freak for each observed pitch. And that gives us our one minus, that gives us our misclassification rate within pitch. Mm -hmm. So there we go. So there we go. So yeah. you can see like for change-ups, or yeah, see it just change up, I, I think. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Less less than twenty percent of the time we, we called it incorrectly. Which is correct. Not okay. too shabby. And it looks like the best is the four seam fastball, but we're gonna talk about that in a second. Mm -hmm. So um, but then there's the FS, which I think was the well, I always forget what that one is. Yeah, I can't remember what F was FS Split, split finger, split finger. S, split finger, yeah. We got so that, that one wrong. really has a problem. Yeah, the model really doesn't know what to do it's with like, split finger. Guesses yeah. Yeah. in a lot of different ways. Exactly. And then there's, yeah, FT, case, like, the, these these things are having a high misclassification rate. Yep. Yeah, so you'd want to wanna figure out why or figure out what you could do about it. Um, mm -hmm. I do show an example here just of putting the probabilities in if you were going to do something with this I just bind the columns back to the predicted and the probability class and if we call a short little head on that yeah so there we go so this is the majority probability class so for example row two there um, FT was predicted and FT was observed and FT was predicted at 75% probability that was FT and you can see that the probability classes, so FF, the, you know, row one there, it was only 50% that it was gonna be a four seam fastball. Um, so the only issue I take with this KNN function is that it only gives you the probability class of the, the, uh, the top voted 
um, uh, the top voted prediction, which which is kind of a bummer. When we do random forest, you'll see that we can get a probability across each of them, and that'll uh, like we did with the penguins data where we created the shiny app. Um, I I find that to be much more useful, but that, that's the the probability. So one thing we can do really quickly before we move on to UMAP is we could try and tune the number of K. So like I said, the number of K is going to be the number of neighbors that you use. And that's where we use the carrot package. Uh, I'm just going to create two data frames here. I've just bind together the scaled and the, and the pitch labels. So it's, it's literally the same data that we just scaled. I just did this for um, simplicity sake. So I could have all the data organized in one. Um, I set the seed. We probably should have set the seed above as well. K and N will start at a random spot. So we want to, you know, you want to set the seed so that it's reproducible. So your results above, if you run this on your own, might be a little different to ours, but they should be consistent if you run this. Mm -hmm. um, so the carrot package is the older version of what is now tidy models. And I probably should spend more time learning tidy models, but um, the comfort blanket of the carrot package was there on it my was, couch it, and it was, was so it warm. was there you're like I, I really like this i don't yeah, want to leave it, it yet it's super nice <laughs> so um basically what you want to do before you train the model is you want to set some control parameters on that training data set um uh, the other thing with this is we could have scaled and centered our data in within this step it'll do it you could take the raw data and scale and center it we already did that so we're not going to do that uh, but all we're going to do here is in, in our train control is set um, repeated cross validation. Um, you can set the number of folds n folds. I think, uh, I think it defaults to five or 10. If, if I remember correctly, we left ours at, at the default and then the repeats, uh, let's see, repeats that's uh, there, the, the, the number, yeah, number it's of looking, cross validation. Yeah, so it looks at boot here or method. And yep. it'll and then, try to identify it. If it can't, it says it's one. So if you scroll down to number, though, scroll down, uh, scroll down to where it defines number, it'll tell us what our what our default number of uh, cross validation groups are. Right. So, uh, so it looks at method. Oh, oh, sorry. So it looks at method. So you could do boot. Oh yes, yes. So we used repeated cross validation, and so then the number I think. Would be should 10. default to 10. I think yeah. if you scroll down, it says it in the written text. Number, oh. Either number of folds or number of resampling iterations. Okay. So we we just put the default in here, which I think is 10, if I remember correctly. Um, if someone knows, you can comment in the comment section. Uh, and then the repeats I put as one. The only reason I did this, you would obviously want to do this more. You know, you might repeat it three times and do like 10 fold cross validation or something like that. Um, the only reason we didn't do that is just to save time because it'll chug for a while. So we run our train control information and we're going to use that control in the argument of the train function here, where we're going to say train, um, the, we're going to train a model where we want to classify the pitches based on all of the data. So that's the tilde dot there. We're going to use all of the data in our uh, cleaning trained data set TC. The method we're going to use is KNN. This makes caret super useful because we could change this to um, random forest if we wanted. We could change. I think I think it, it abbreviates it RF in here. But either way, you could change it to whatever you want. And it's pretty cool. Um, and then train control. We are using that control information. And now we're going to let this go for a second. It's just chugging through. Run. It's uh, repeating stuff. It's yeah. It's doing uh, stuff. Yeah. It's doing cross validation. On 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Just, there you go. Okay. So now we've finished. We can run the model and we get some information uh, about the model. Um, obviously, it says right there as you're reading through no pre processing because we didn't scale and center our data. We did that beforehand. Uh, there it is. Repeat tenfold cross validation was indeed the default. Um, repeated one time. So we didn't repeat that any other time. Um, summary of the samples. Uh, resampling accuracy. So now it's tried a bunch of different values for K and you can see the accuracy looks to top out right there at 78%. So that's going to be the optimal. If you scroll down of uh, the last sentence there. So the accuracy was used to select the optimal model using the largest value and the final value used for the model was seven. So we're going to be now using a KNN model that has seven K's and uh, you could plot this 
and look at how the accuracy changes if, if you use more values. You could use a grid search. You could search a grid of values one through a hundred and it'll, again, it'll take longer, but that, that stuff you could use in the control element. Um, we can predict this. Now this is a KNN fit with seven neighbors instead of four, which we used beforehand. And we can predict that on the new data. It's going to take a second. And then we run our table and we get our confusion matrix. And uh, I don't think we classify or our classification rate was slightly higher, right? I think it was uh, 72. What was our misclassification rate in the original one? I can't uh, the misclassification rate was uh, here. Let's just quickly, uh, quickly run it just to originally it was so yeah 20 so we were at 72 percent 72 percent accuracy and our sevenfold cross validation has 78 so we proved our accuracy by six um, percent yeah by about six percent uh cool okay so let's take a look at that so we looked at the table and let's look within pitch because remember that was really useful so some of the some of the uh, pitch types got better. <laughs> Here, very some good. of the pitch types uh, did not. Did not, and so there might be reasons for that, and there might be things that we we think about and we talk about. So I think if you run the so okay, so this is here. Why don't here? Why don't I do this, and then we're gonna save this as um, K four. Yep. And then I'm going to run it with this latest one and then do a left join on K4 uh, by... Observed. Uh, yeah, observed. And then we're going to leave it as that. So then we get the dot That's X represents the yeah. new optimized model. The dot Y yeah. represents the older. So, so you could have done a suffix like K8... K4 or something, right? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. There we go. Now we're cooking with gas. Hey, okay. So we can see... Um, lower is better in this case. This is... Yeah, this is misclassification rate. So a lower number means we're misclassifying less. So, for example, change up in K8 improved by about... 2% improved its misclassification by about 2%. Um, let's find one that got worse there, FC. Yeah, so actually, actually got about two or three, yeah, 2% worse. Mm -hmm. Four seam fastball improved a bunch, the FF there. But you can also see by the frequency count that it is super. It is a super, or not a super majority, but it is a large, it's large a, percentage of the Exactly. Pitches. And the knuckleball, where we had, you know, knuckleball and the uh, FS, the, the slider, are two that we had the biggest problems with. But look how low. I mean, they make up, collectively, they make up just over 500, you know, right around 500 observations within this data set of thousands upon thousands. So, you know, that leads us to believe that we might need to do something in terms of... Um, uh, There's a maybe class dealing, imbalance. Dealing with class imbalance or uh, maybe figuring out other groupings of these pitches to try and, like, say, okay, this, these two are most similar. They can be kind of grouped together. And, um, you know, there might be some feature engineering that we might have to try in order to. Uh, uh, and we could talk about class imbalance in a later episode, um, mm -hmm. certainly. But uh, this was a kind of a cool use of KNN to look at, you know, optimizing K and, and things like that. And now we can sort of take this to like a little bit of a visualization. It's not exactly K and N, but uh, conceptually it's... it helps us visualize some of these groups in a different way than the hierarchical analysis that we did last week. So mm -hmm. we want to walk through UMAP. Sure. So yeah, so UMAP is a is a method that's come out in the last several years. Um, it's it's kind of it's it's a useful way to visualize your data where you have both large dimensional data, but also a lot of measurements th that you can use here. The key here is that you have a lot of measurements because what we want to do is try to find relationships between the, the classes that we have here um, across um, multiple, multiple dimensions, right? So 
typically, I mean, people might use like a PCA to do this uh, as a principal component analysis to find the eigenvectors that you're going to be using to, to look at there. Um, supposedly, I, I don't know a ton about UMAP, supposedly there's some eigenvectors um, and PCA going on under the hood. But the, the cool thing about UMAP is the way that it is actually trying to find relationships within clusters and organizes them within clusters. And so when you're looking at a UMAP, what's important to, to recognize, once again, this is what I understand. If somebody knows more about UMAP, yeah. definitely comment down below and tell me, Ellis, you totally got this wrong. You misunderstand this. Um, <laughs> I've never used UMAP, so. Uh, yeah, so you, we used, you, we've used this on some projects. We've used this on some projects where we look at I've single cell stuff, this. and it's pretty yeah. pretty cool to see the cellular stuff. Um, but here we're looking at what are the what are the dimensions and relationships between pitches. So given these nine or ten parameters that we have, how can we start to cluster and group them, and then look at how they're all related, distilled down. And so the way this is going to do this is we're going to run we're going to take train cleaned remove pitch type because that that is a, our classification we don't particularly that's not useful in our umap we're going to use that to help visualize our umap but it, we don't throw that into our umap because our umap also needs a matrix which means everything needs to be of the same class and that means we want it all to be um, numeric mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to throw it into umap we're just going to use the default values uh, and while that's going we can talk a second about the the one other thing that I know that we could change, and we looked at it and it didn't actually change it a lot, which was n neighbors. So UMAP by default is gonna look, it's kind of gonna be using a KN type idea where it's looking at the neighbors around that each point. And by default, it uses n equals 15. So it's gonna look at the 15 nearest neighbors to start trying to come up with relationships between it. And as it's running, it's so it's running 15 neighbors. Now we could have set n neighbors to the seven that we found in K and N. Yeah. Right. Um, well, and n neighbors represents just the number of points. Oh, okay. it. it's not like a K and N where it's looking at I see. the cluster, uh, like a total cluster number. Yes. Um, okay. At least that one second, that's how I understand it to work. Um, okay. but so it's, it's doing some, some crazy magic in, um, Crazy magic in the, in the back end here, and it, yeah. it just takes a while to run because we have not super small data here, and it's doing it for each one. So we're just gonna kind of let it run. I think this is important. I probably should just run this ahead of time because we, we also did this for fifty, and that we did save as um, as you want to check it out on your own. Yeah, if you want to look at it on your own to see the difference between the two that we have here, um, but just generally when you're looking at data trying to do dimensional reduction for your visualization can be really helpful when you're trying to find patterns that may not be immediately recognizable yeah trying to do dimension reduction for your prior to data analysis can be useful like you could use pca and and you know use the principal components within a model if, if you wanted to do something like yeah that. exactly it looks like it ran yeah it finished okay there we go all right so uh, we've got our UMAP here. So now if we, we could just print this and it's just, it's got, it's a UMAP embedding. So it's embedding our 2005 or 25,458 pitches into two dimensions, the UMAP one and UMAP two. Yep. Um, and so then it, it, we've got some objects here that we can kind of look at. But what we're going to do now is we're going to create a vector of the pitch pitch so the class or the short short name to the long name because we're going to want this in our plot so we're going to say like ff equals forcing fastball yeah. just because clearly we've had some difficulty because well, we're not very good at remembering <laughs> yeah we're like oh wait si what's that one again yeah so i just want this in the plot like that so this is a, vec a named vector of the short names that we have here and the long name vector yeah so we're going to take the umap pitch which is that umap that we just fit pluck the layout out of it because it's a list so we're going to use the the layout which is the umap1 and umap2 turn it into a data frame because it's a matrix set the names to be umap1 and umap2 just so that they're named otherwise they're unnamed and it's kind of ugly uh, what gonna, is it like x and y or something yeah i think it's like yeah x and y let's quickly head 
Yeah, X1, X2. Uh, X1, mm -hmm. yeah. Not, not very descriptive. Yeah, so UMAP1 and UMAP2. We're going to bind calls the, the pitching data so that we can add in um, the information around the pitches themselves. Yeah. We're going to add in a cleaner pitch type, which is this vector. And we're going to use vectorization to assign that full name into the pitch type. Third one to ggplot, ggplot, where x is umap1 and y is umap2. And use geom point. So we're going to draw a point for all t nearly 26,000 um, records here. Yeah. We're going to color it by pitch type so that we can see the clusters of pitch. And it's an alpha to be 0.5 so that we can actually see what's going on here. So we can just do a quick ggplot. Well, so while it's, while it's uh, straining on that, can you go through... Because uh, we haven't talked about this a lot, that in that mutate where you set the pitch type, you, mm -hmm. the, you quickly said uh, we're going to use a vector uh, approach to put this in. Can you just talk through what what you did there for? Yeah, second? sure. So yeah, this is vectorization. So um, yep. it's a kind of trick in R that exists where it just kind of helps speed things up where you don't have to explicitly state each one. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm doing here is we've got train clean train cleaned pitch type and train clean pitch type is a vector of these the, the summarized names that we have here and so what i can do is i can pass it in to my named vector and what it's going to do is going to go every time so let's take a quick look at this let's just do let's look at the first 10. all right so we have f f f t s l f f Right, so these first four here. So mm -hmm. you can see we repeat FF twice. And so what it's gonna do is it's now gonna grab the FF column or FF entry from this vector for C yep. fastball, put that into a vector. Then yep. FT, well FT is two seam fastball. Drop two seam fastball into the, the a new vector. Yep. SL is slider, so grab that. But now we've come back to FF again. And you might think, oh, it's going to throw an error. Well, no, it's actually just going to grab that FF column again. It's the it's the R version of Excel's V lookup type of thing. Yeah, so it's just going to repeatedly grab. Yeah. It's going to because we have the column names, it's going to just pluck out of the correct place and put them in the same order that this train cleaned pitch type is. Yeah, that's cool. That's good. So there you go. So we end up with this nice full name vectorized it's very nice so here's our ggplot2 it's a little a little hard to to look at um but you can kind of see clusters here like look at this this is four seam fastballs all right mm -hmm. here we can see curve balls over here uh, we got these uh, two seam fastballs over here so it's just kind of interesting to see this cluster but i can't really like click on this and see what's going on so we're going to rely on an old friend plotly and Yay. ggplotly to do this for us to make it much more interactive and fun. So I'm going to make this actually full page. Uh, actually, let me save this web page. Map. So now we can. Ba, ba, ba. Might be easier to open it up. There we go. Computers chug a logging. We've got twenty six thousand points to yeah. plot here, but here we go. Oh, look at that. That's pretty good. That's pretty sweet here. So I'll draw, draw our little view here. But all right, so this is the plot lead, and this is the result of the UMAP. And what's cr critical to remember about UMAP is the relationship between these two clusters non-existent. Don't worry about that. Once again, as I understand it, but the cluster, the relationship within the cluster, does yeah. matter. So you can see here, like, here, ah, uh -huh. whoa, zoomed in accidentally. Yeah. Come on, zoom out. Come on, computer. I think you just double click, right? I, oh. I did. Oh, weird. It's uh, oh, there it is. Let me try that. Oh, it's just struggle busing. Yeah, it's so much data. Here, we'll just try to use the, the viewer here. All right. So I was trying to be too fancy. I'm sorry. But you can see the relationships here. Where with Plotly, you can double click, 
okay, there's all our four seam fastballs. Yeah. And there's very clearly two clusters here, so there must be, like... Guys who throw harder or something like guys that. Guys that throw faster, yeah. guys that don't, or vice versa, who knows. We, yeah. don't, we don't actually know. We don't have any of the statistics and whatnot being printed here. With Plotly, we could actually do that. Um, but now you can look at the relationship. Okay, what is what 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 might be a, a good thing to compare to a a four seam fastball? Be well, let's try something on the other. Oh yeah, sure, yeah. See, oh, there, there's there nice overlap there. So they're they're highly related. Yeah. I mean, they're they're definitely different types of pitches. You, you, this also really helps you see why there can be large misclassifications within certain groups. Some of those two seam fastballs could easily be maybe classified as um, uh, classified as four seam fastballs, because remember what we're looking at, the, the we're looking at here is even though we're, we're operating in two dimensions, I believe UMAP is using all of the features of our data yeah. to basically get the data, uh, get, get those features, whatever it was, 15 variables or something like that, uh, independent variables, get those variables into a way of um, get them into two dimensions so that they can be plotted like this. So we can see their orientation to each other, just like you might plot PCA principal components. Mm -hmm. um, All right. So now we looked at two scene. What else would we want to compare against the four scene? Well, how about uh, the curveball? Something curve different. Ball. All right. Ooh. So we yeah. See, so we see some separation. There's some then, pretty clear separation between. So I do these. wonder, like, if if the group up above is like the sorry, the group down below are the guys that throw faster because it seems like they have even more separation between their their off speed pitch, their curveball, and their and their fastball. Whereas the other guys maybe are more blended, or maybe the guys up above are more skilled pitchers and they can disguise pitches better. I don't know. It's. It, or maybe they're maybe the, maybe those guys throw faster because they can throw the curveball harder. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, right. The fun one here is cutter, which kind of sits as right there in the middle between the two. And whenever I think of cutter, I think of Mariano Rivera, the the famous Hall of Fame closer for the Yankees, and he he just would basically come out and throw a cutter, and that's like I think all he would do, uh, and it would come at you so fast, uh, but it had this crazy wicked movement on it. So. Mm. That's where you can see the cutter is like this maybe fastball that has this like side to side movement that yeah, really that, that got captured by the pitch FX and then by our UMAP yeah, here yeah. kind of showing curveball known to have a lot of movement. Four seam fastball it's coming straight at you. It's coming at you. Yeah. Here's somewhere in the middle where it's fast, but it's also got some movement. Yeah. And then the knuckle curve is pretty similar knuckle to the curve. curve. More of a curve. Like these two. Are, they're like right overlapping, so it'd be really right. easy to misclassify and those. And that, that's two. also yeah, that's where the knuckle curve. I think what two hundred seventy-five times was classified as a curveball. You could see why that would probably happen. So again, this gets back to the maybe we have what do we have there? Ten different pitch types. The, the, Nine, this gets yeah. back to where maybe misclassification is a function of us engineering some features that group some of these pitch types together. Like is. Is curveball really that different from knuckle curve? Maybe it is to the batter. Or, or maybe know. it is to the like the pitcher. I mean, I'll, I'll... maybe it is to the pitcher. I don't know, you know. But um, certainly, based on this, it looks like they are from the same tree. Yeah. In some way, they're cousins. <laughs> they're cousins. Yeah. Or I would say more like the cutter, the cutter and the curveball are cousins. These are like siblings. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. They're, they're more related. Closer in the family tree. Closer, yeah, for sure. Uh, but yeah, so this is a fun way to visualize your data. You can definitely have a lot of fun with UMAP, and it just takes a bit to chug. But yeah. Yeah. that's that's kind of what things are happen going towards these days, where you can get more insight, but you just need a powerful computer to just sit there for a while. You're and pay for it, yeah. And, and chug through it. <laughs> yeah. No, totally. <laughs> But yeah, I think with that, I think we've we've gone through everything. We've talked about KNN, we've talked about clustering, we talked about how you can use UMAP to kind of visualize these results here and, and see what's going on. Awesome. So thank you all so much for joining us for episode fifty three. Or no, fifty four. Fifty four, wow. Yeah. Of of Tidy X. As always, my name is Ellis Hughes, and you can find me on Twitter at, at Ellis underscore Hughes. 
And I'm Patrick Ward, and you can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. And you can tweet to the both of us at tidy at, uh, at tidy underscore explained on Twitter, uh, or you can email us tidy dot uh, explained at gmail.com. You can open an issue on the GitHub repo, uh, or you can subscribe, like, comment on the YouTube page and uh, let us know what you think, other ideas, things you'd like to see, things we missed, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Don't forget to subscribe and keep on exploring your world.